in order to get the exposure that you need to get the proper sterilization, can you do multiple pools at one time? You, do you need to be careful at placement? Is there more technique involved than there is an autoplay? Uh, yes. Um, in, in the autoplay, you still have to do be careful with placement, and you're only allowed to put in like two to three sets of tools at a time for the, that 45 minute period. For ours, we're, getting, we're looking into getting um, having three capsules uh, holding within about probably three to two, set, two to three sets of tools per capsule. Um, so it's actually really, really efficient. Is there, a, is there any need to monitor the UV output from the UV as well? Yes, of course, because the UV, the, the UV bulbs do die out over time. They have a, a lifespan of about 8,000 minutes. Um, 8,000 minutes or I'm not sure. 8,000 uh, 8, 8, hours, sorry. Um, and uh, you have to, that's one thing you have to incorporate a uh, monitoring system um, and a, a, a detected by, so it depends. So initially you'll be able to put in the, the, the tools and uh, it'll do it probably effectively within two minutes. Towards the end of its life cycle, you probably have to put it in there, put it in for, for 10 minutes because the intensity of the bulbs do that. Last question. Is there gonna be a trust factor in I know you have an advisor, so uh, or, you know somebody who's like your test market or what have you. But I would imagine there's sort of a leap of faith in this technology that has to be overcome. Uh, definitely, and that's where the market adaption comes from. You can compare us to, for example, back in the old days, people just thought of the oven cooking food, and then someone came around with a microwave and they said, "I can heat this up equally as the oven can, you know, a minute." And you know, you got to get take that that adaption rate into consideration. Um, but with having our advisor, he actually got nominated America's top dentist, and with him backing us and, and that product being in his office, and he's been in business for 40 plus years, um, we have a pretty strong, you know, the people are rely on his opinion. So that's that's good to have him on our side. Okay. Thank you very much. This is my partner, Mark Lyons. Uh, first of all, we'd like to thank you for bringing us up here again. Usually people can't get me to shut my mouth about this. I'm happy you actually invited me up a second time. Uh, we're here representing microorganic technologies. Uh, microorganic technologies, we're focused on organic waste. In particular, municipal wastewater. Now there's a reason for this. There's a reason we're passionate about it. It's not because it smells good, as anyone that's been in our lab can tell you. It's because it's a big problem. And as a big problem, there's a big opportunity. The United States, the United States continues to generate about 30 billion gallons of wastewater every day that needs to be dealt with. This costs us environmentally and it costs us economically. Over 30% of all wastewater utility plants operate at a loss. This is not surprising when you take into consideration that they continue to consume about 21 billion kilowatt hours annually. <coughs> to put that into perspective, that's about 5% of the nation's total energy expenditure. The real irony here is that organic material is actually incredibly rich and there's more than enough energy in this material to take the treatment process from a loss to a net positive. This is where we come in. At Microorganics, we're developing a microbial fuel cell, which is a device that converts chemical energy to electrical energy by allowing microorganisms to degrade it directly. To get into the nuts and bolts, here's how the system will work. Utilizing a continuous flow process, waste enters the chamber where microorganisms, literally living on the anode, break it down. During this process, they generate hydrogen ions, electrons, and treated material, which will then exit the chamber. The electrons are literally deposited right onto the electrode, where they migrate to the corresponding one. Likewise, the hydrogen ions migrate through solution, where they all combine with molecular oxygen to form water. Now this completes the treatment process and generates electricity. Well, what we've just done here is subtle. This is a sharp break from the current technology and the current treatment technology. We'll get into that later. That's exactly what we've been doing in these proof of concept models that we operate in our lab. Now, we recognize that this is not going to be treating the one million gallons plus that we're going to need to be dealing with. To do that, we're going to adapt this design to a flow through like you see here. Uh, we're currently planning this and should have one operational within the next month. We come in as an alternative to the current aeration process. This process bubbles oxygen into a liquid where the microorganisms use it to achieve a complete breakdown of materials. 
Our process is similar, except we don't need to bubble in oxygen. Like I said before, we're capable of using atmospheric oxygen, which is important because it's at about 20% concentration, as opposed to the minuscule concentration that it will be in water. Again, a subtle difference, but this equates to a very high operating expenditure for these plants. Um, again, we're, uh, documentation has proven that we have the ability to process this waste at current levels, and that we'll plug right in as a replacement. There's a number of options available to an end user here, including traditional aeration, membrane bioreactors, and sequential batch reactors. Now, all of these will treat the waste, but ours is the only solution that will generate electricity and has the added bonus of reducing the amount of sludge, which is another significant operating expenditure for these plants. So, what does this mean to a municipal wastewater treatment plant? The top right chart is from my third. It shows that aeration is about two thirds of the electricity consumed at your municipal wastewater treatment plants. This electricity savings has a value of about three hundred and fifty thousand dollars per year, with comparable operations and maintenance costs. So far, we've talked to a few customers in the space. Acom, an in, uh, influencer in the market, a civil engineering firm that designs wastewater treatment plants, retrofits, and new plants. Beechnoff, an industrial food processing plant. Finch Pine, a pulp and paper plant. And two municipal wastewater treatment plants. The picture on the right here is Richard Lyons. He's the executive director of the Albany County Sewer District. Richard Lyons has been instrumental in helping us understand the wastewater treatment process and how our technology would one save him money and fit into his process without disrupting. He's also given us a verbal confirmation that he would be interested in doing a pilot demonstration of our technology in parallel to his current aeration staff. The key here is NYSERDA already has paid to submeter his plant, so he knows exactly the energy being consumed by each pump and every light in his plant. So when we run our process parallel, we can see the value generated for that particular plant. This is a snapshot of the wastewater treatment market. BCC research forecasts the market to be $30 billion by 2012. The market splits two thirds municipal, one third industrial. This $20 billion municipal market breaks down into three different plant sizes. The 12,000 plants that are less than 1 million gallons per day, the medium plants from one to five million gallons per day, and the large plants at five million gallons plus per day. In short, in the United States, there's about 15,000 municipal wastewater treatment plants that could substitute this technology for their current, and also the industrial market. Our strategy to go to market is using commercial partners. Microorganics aims to be a technology provider and partner with companies that already participate in the wastewater market. We want to leverage their distribution and manufacturing capabilities. A local company, Environment One, is a potential partner that we could use. Furthermore, we've identified other partners in the United States, including Aqua Aerobic Systems and Nancrete Engineering. The competitive environment for microbial fuel cells has emerged. This technology has developed mostly in the research labs of Penn State to validate that it actually works and we can go straight, directly to electricity. The first player in the space is MFC out of Israel that has $5 million of venture funding. Pillis Energy from Ohio is focused on, focused on using this technology to generate hydrogen, which we didn't discuss. It's kind of using the system in a little bit different manner. Cambrian Innovation is using this technology to power ocean floor sensors running the microbial fuel cell off the ocean floor sediment to provide a, just a trickle power required for these sensors. Microorganics is also focused on the municipal and industrial wastewater markets. And we're using a material innovation developed at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, which gives us a performance increase over the competition. This chart from the Rensselaer lab shows that microorganics proprietary material yields a six times better performance in uh, energy output than the currently used graphite felt. Here's a snapshot of our team. Brent, the president, is a biochemist. He has published papers from his work at the labs at RPI. Myself, the vice president of marketing and strategy, and six interns that range from mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, chemical engineers, environmental engineers, and civil engineers. Our back, we are backed by our network of advisors, including the Severino Center for Entrepreneurship and Dr. Gino O'Connor, 
RPI's incubator, the Emerging Ventures Ecosystem, and Dick Frederick, Environment One Corporation, and George Earl, and the RPI Research Center, New York State Center for Automated Technologies and Systems, which will be instrumental in our design process so that this technology can be manufactured economically. This is a snapshot of the financials. They start once we reach a commercial product, so that <coughs> depends on the product development and how quickly we raise funds. At the end of year four, we project to break even, and you can see revenue scale. This is basically as we roll out a commercial distribution network, as we add more partners. The exit strategy here is a technology provider to the wastewater treatment market is, is probably to be acquired. Such companies that would acquire a technology like this are the large players in the wastewater and water markets, including GE Power and Water, Siemens Water Technologies, Hall Corporation, ITT Industries, U.S. Environment, and Hitachi Plant Technologies. These companies regularly acquire new technologies to the wastewater market. Over the past few years, over 20 deals have been completed at an average price of two times revenue. In conclusion, we should be leaving you with three main points. The first is that this represents a revolutionary new technology that you will see in the marketplace within the next five to ten years. The second is that now is the time for startups such as ourselves to be developing a comprehensive and defensible intellectual property portfolio to exit to larger players such as GE and Siemens. And the third and most important is that we've already begun this process with a license on a material that has a six times increase in performance over anything else available in the market. My name is Brent Salina. This is my partner, Mark Lyons. Here at Microorganic, our view is a simple one. There's energy and waste, and we shouldn't be paying to throw it away. Thank you. We'd be happy to take your questions. What do you mean by license of a material? Like, can you explain the process a little bit more about how you get inserted into the, the stream? And um, as far as how the material relates to what we're doing? I guess there's two different questions. Yeah. Start with the first, the first question. What do you mean by license of a RPI material? holds patents on a material. This is a new application of that material. So we are in discussions with the OTC to either release or file this application. A microorganic material. It's a nanomaterial. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then the second question is how this fits into, replaces the aeration step in an existing wastewater treatment process? Yeah, I just clarified that. So okay. you're, you're kind of putting this system then into the waste stream. We have that slide on that. And Correct, yeah. That. Um, based on the current data, from as far as uh, the footprint that we need, we realize that we really come in as a almost exact replica of the current aeration treatment with the caveat that we can operate with far less, uh, far smaller energy consumption. Um, so as far as treatment efficiency, we're identical. As far as footprint, we're more or less ballpark. Um, so without any major change in behavior, they can implement our system. In short, what they do, they bubble oxygen because they use aerobic bacteria. Mm -hmm. We use anaerobic bacteria. Our microorganisms will treat the waste without the presence of oxygen. Correct. So you've got a unit with this material in that gets kind of physically Correct. inserted in. Our material is literally, uh, so as I showed before, the microorganisms are living on the electrode. Um, our material coats that electrode and allows them to do their job more efficiently and six times faster. Uh, there, there's a growing trend in, in wastewater treatment, particularly with high organics, to, to produce biogas and burn biogas. Uh, so how do, you, how do you fit in with that trend? I'm really happy to talk about that, actually. Um, it's because of how that process works. First of all, it doesn't necessarily do a complete treatment. Um, you need oxygen to be able to break down the material entirely. Uh, while our bugs are technically anaerobic, because there's oxygen on the other end of that wire, we can mimic that process and we get a better breakdown than organic. The second is, the main reason that's used is that it's to generate biogas. Um, you have a ton of issues there associated with purifying that. By directly harvesting electricity, we sidestep all of those issues. Um, and then the third is that because of those cost prohibitive measures, that technology is only cost viable above about three million gallons daily. As we said, three quarters of the market is less than a million gallons daily. Great. Thank you.